from New York City. This is Comic News Insider, your weekly podcast for everything comic book, animation, sci-fi, and pop culture. Produced by Joe Gonzalez. Here's your host, Jimmy Aquino. Episode 1225. Hey everybody, it's Jimmy Aquino with another regular format, Comic News Insider for you. As mentioned, Comic Beat Insider, the Friday and then turned to Monday podcast that Heidi McDonald of The Beat and I had been doing for the past year. Uh, we are taking a hiatus all of August off. We may come back once or twice a month, um, or just sort of sporadically, but all good. Uh, we had a really great time doing it. We're just getting busier, that's all. Um, but I do have my old pal Grace Helbig is returning to talk about her voiceover work in Jellystone, among other things, later this week. Um, maybe Wednesday I'll release that. I'm talking to her later today. And because of that, I'm running a little behind, so it's going to be a quickie episode here. Um... So let's get right into those reviews. First up we have uh, Melissa is going to talk about Gru meets Tarzan, number one, from Dark Horse. Oh, this is Melissa, and we're going to talk about... Sergio Aragonez's Gru meets Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan. It's a lot of title. Um, it is done by Mark Evanier, uh, art by Thomas Yates, oh, also written by Sergio Aragonez. And so I am going to recommend this comic for a couple different reasons. One, it starts out, it opens in a Comic-Con that never was, quote-unquote, and it is just Uh, you know nostalgia after two years of not being able to go (laughs) and like kind of a funny glimpse of like what comic-con is actually like i mean a little tongue-in-cheek if you've never been so i mean just reading it for that for those first pages is great and then we kind of go to a dream sequence or like a little bit of a um exploration of how comics get dreamed up i guess i don't really know how to explain this one um and i'll I'll be honest i'm not familiar with Gru. i of course know tarzan um for knowing tarzan even though i've never um read the um, the books or anything um honestly i just want to recommend this one because it was incredibly fun to read there's a mix of art styles from Uh, kind of like fun cartoony, um, like I said, tongue-in-cheek Comic-Con exploration to that really, really classic adventure comic book style. Um, I I don't know. I hands down recommend this one because it was just a lot of fun to read, and I can't wait to actually go back and explore all the little details that are hidden uh, in the art for the Comic-Con panels. Uh, so definitely pick it up. It's from Dark Horse. I think you'll get a kick out of this one. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, and next up from DC Comics, Ricky is here to talk about Icon and Rocket Season 1, Number 1. Here he is. Milestone Comics' latest offerings have faced America's history of racism and discrimination head on, even to the point of making these problems a catalyst for superhero creation. Icon and Rocket Number 1 continues this trend, but it centers on another core question heroes of all kinds face at one point or another. How much change should a superhero truly enact? Written by Reginald Hudlin and illustrated by Doug Braithwaite, with colors by Brad Anderson, Icon and Rocket starts things off with a break-in gone wrong, in which the soon-to-be Rocket, Raquel Irvin, leads a group of her boyfriend and his friends into a home they soon find out belongs to Augustus Freeman, a.k.a. Icon. A lot happens in this first issue, starting with how Hutland presents Icon's origin story as nearly identical to that of Superman's, with a ship carrying a super being crash landing on Earth. Only the family that picks Icon up is black and is part of America's slave system. This organizes the ideas in the comic well and makes its stands clear. Icon and Rocket will take up the centuries-long fight against systemic racism (coughs) and try to install real and impactful change. There's much to talk about in Icon's approach to heroics in this issue and how they differ from the usual punch-kick laser beam affairs of the more mainstream superbooks. But the fun is in landing on these ideas as they come up in the reading. Just know that Icon and Rocket have no interest in just cleaning up the streets. They want to make sure the streets change, period. 
Jack Waithwaite's art does wonders portraying the extraordinariness of Icon's abilities without overshadowing the ideas present in the story. His character's body language are always fluctuating and going against expectations to accommodate more than just one reading of them. Their complex takes on the very concept of superheroism and they hold everything up nicely. I can't recommend Icon and Rocket number one enough. It's the start of something special that wants to say something important in a different way. It might be just what superhero comics needs the most in this current historical moment, and we should all be reading and talking about uh, Yeah, I totally agree. I really love this. I'm a big fan of Milestone Comics. If you listen regularly, you know that. I'm very happy to see them come back, and uh, I like this, this sort of retelling of the origin and um, <clears throat> really look forward to uh, what is coming down the line. I agree with everything Ricky said. Just so, so good. Um, very happy to have um, Milestone Comics back. All right, next up we have from Image is Mirka and Dolfo's Sweet Paprika number one. And Melissa is back to talk about it. Hey, y'all. Let's talk about Sweet Paprika. So Sweet Paprika is written and drawn by Mirka and Dolfo. Uh, and this is issue number one from Image Comics. And uh, <clears throat> Sweet <laughs> Sweet Paprika is the story of a um, demon imp. And uh, she is the head of a major publishing company. And she kind of grows up in a really oddly strict, sort of sexually oppressed household. Um I'm not really sure what the story is supposed to be about, oh, no. but I will say it's definitely not safe for work. Uh, um, it mm-hmm. is a fun read. It is um, definitely like bubblegum goth, and there's a lot of sex and a lot of sexiness and a lot of um, playful demonic elements to it. And so it, it is a fun read. It is definitely not, it's not really my cup of tea, but I think a lot of people will really enjoy it. The art style is sort of like this chaotic, fun hellscape. I don't even know how else to describe it. It's really different than anything else I have seen before. And so I enjoyed it for for those features of it. Um, Like I said, this is only issue number one. If you like sexy demon imps and you don't mind imagery of her father bursting in, interrupting her masturbation session. This might be for you. (laughs) So uh, pick up Sweet Paprika uh, wherever you get your comics. I can hear their awkwardness in Melissa's voice there. That's awesome. Thank you so much for doing that, Melissa. Uh, And finally, in comics, we have Superman, Son of Kal-El, number one from DC. And Ashley is here to chat about that. Hey, this is Ashley Lanny, and this is my review of Superman, Son of Kal-El, number one, out through DC this week. It's written by Tom Taylor. Artist is John Timms. The colorist is Gabe Eltrab, and letterer is Dave Sharp. Um, I am going to be honest, I did not know much about John Kent going into this. Um, I've read a few things uh, here and there with him in it, but I didn't know much about the character other than he was the son of Superman and Lois Lane. The book starts off um, kind of a cool scene where you see all the stuff that Superman has going on, and um, everyone is telling him that even though there's, you know, a planetary invasion going on, there's somewhere else that he needs to be. And so he is there for the birth of his son. And from the very beginning, John Kent has a lot of expectations put on him just from who his parents are and and the powers that he's going to have. So um, you kind of get a sense of like the kind of person that he is, the kind of hero that he's going to be. There's some really cool scenes where you see he's got like all the Superman powers. Uh, My favorite panel was probably where he's just grabbing a missile straight out of the air um, and just saying, nope, like that thing's not going to hit its target. Um, It wasn't super action packed, not to saying there wasn't a lot of action in it, but it wasn't just like this go, go, go jam packed comic. It did have a reference to um, the island of Porto Maltese, which the only thing I really know about that island is just from reading um, an excerpt of what the new Suicide Squad is going to be about, so I'm not sure if that's really going to be 
um, anything going forward. Uh, but overall, it's just super solid comic, great writing, uh, super nice art, and uh, super fantastic colors. Uh, yeah, I agree on this one. I really love it. I do have been following the Superman Brian Michael Bendis's, um when he was on it. I think he's the one that introduced Jonathan. You know, first he was a little kid, then he goes to travel the universe and comes back as, you know, an, a late teen. Is he 20 yet? Maybe he's just 18 or 19. He might be in his 20s. Um, and, you know, and the whole idea is he's going to be the new 21st century Superman. So poor Kal Al's getting shipped off to the farm. <laughs> but, um, but I really enjoyed this take on I like the character. And um, although I do feel like the sort of story was sort of rushed and thrown in there. Um, well, rushed over a few years, but it was just like, um, yeah, it's like, oh, Superman's got a son now, and he's going to be the next one. And it's like, okay. I liked him when he was with the Legion of Superheroes, um, which, I, of course, I love those old comic Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. So um, I'm also hoping he sort of stay with, with them for a while, but we'll see how long this lasts, and maybe. I mean, Kal-El is still going to be around, but yeah, for sure. It was really good. Enjoyed it, and look forward to more. Uh, finally, we have a Snake Eyes. I know it came out last week, but I wanted to talk about I finally got to see it. I went to a theater. There's about 10 of us in there, so I felt pretty safe, and uh, it was really a, um, a cool, pleasant experience. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Um, this is, of course, Henry Golding, who I did not imagine could be an action star, which is unfair, um, but because I really like him. He's just a charming, leading man type, but he pulled it off in great fight scenes, um, really good cast. I uh, really enjoyed um, uh, the interaction between them all. Um, it is an origin story, so it's a retelling in a sense, I guess. Uh, I, I, the only thing I didn't like that much was, because um, <clears throat> the part of the orange story, I don't, don't want to like spoil too much, is that uh, Snake Eyes wasn't the best guy. Like he, well, he had good intentions because of something with the family tragedy. You know, as, as all heroes have, if some some parent dies or some <laughs> tragedy happens, but um, but his main goal was to sort of avenge that tragedy. So it made him make very bad decisions, which I understand. But I felt like, oh, they let that, they let that linger a while. Wait, <laughs> these bad decisions were a little too long, but it was all right. Um, Haruko Abe as Akiko is fantastic. She's a new character. <clears throat> Andrew Koji as Tommy, um, who we realize later on in the movie who's who he's going to become. And there's the GI Joe tie-in. Scarlet does show up. Um, Iko Was, who you recognize, would be is one of the is plays Hardmaster. Um, it's a really, really good cat. Oh, and uh, Samara Weaving is Scarlet. Um, and uh, it's action packed. Like I said, great, great, uh, uh, great fight scenes. And uh, it was really fun. Really fun tale. It was a little, little long, maybe, but I, I still really enjoyed it. Um, nobody to review it besides me, but I did see that Larry Hama, who is, of course, famous comics writer and did a long, many, many, many years run on writing the G.I. Joe comics, he had this to say on his Facebook. When he saw it, just got home from a private screening of Snake Eyes. It surpasses my expectations a lot, uh, by a lot, much more of a martial arts film than the last two outings, agreed, but still brings in the Joes through Scarlet and Cobra through the Baroness. Very impressive fight choreography, which is mostly practicals, and the acting quality of the leads lends the subject matter much gravitas. There will be those who would not like the deviance from my comics continuity, but I felt it was what needed to be done to make the story work in the present. Um, so yeah, as, as I said, it sort of uh, deviated, but... um. I enjoyed it, and I'm glad to see Larry Hama, who wrote most of those comics, enjoyed it, so that's pretty cool. So give it a check out and let me know what you think. Um, okay, got some news here. Let's get into that. This week in the news. All right, over to Emily at the news desk. Here she is. Hello, CNI listeners. This is I, Emily Edwards, coming at you with the news. First up, Taika Waititi's animated Flash Gordon film is now going to be a live action film. While the cult hit 1980s film is a favorite of CNI, this won't be a direct adaptation of it, but based on the original Alex Raymond comic strips. While Waititi is writing the project, he has yet to commit to directing it as he's quite busy with multiple other projects. Maybe Waititi will use host Jimmy's recasting of it when they revisited the film last year on Comic Beat Insider. Yes, I did. I had John Boyega's Flash. I think I had um, Lana Condor as Dale, Keanu Reeves as Ming, um, The Rock as, who'd have, oh, as Voltan. I had a really good cast. I think uh, Taika should give it a listen. And uh, check it out. I did tag him on the socials <laughs> with my new cast. Anyway, back to Emily. 
Just saying. All right, next up, famed comic artist Jock will both draw and write a three-issue prestige comic book series titled Batman One Dark Night. Scheduled to debut December 7th, it will be set up during a Gotham City blackout as Batman is stuck on the wrong side of town. Now, each issue will be 48 pages and for readers 17 and up as part of DC's Black Label imprint. What is happening on the wrong side of town is what I want to know. <laughs> All right. Next up in Marvel news, Marvel Comics sibling Super Team Power Pack is returning. Creators Louise Simonson and Simonson. June Brigman will reunite on a new limited series. No word on the date of release just yet. In DC news, DC launches a Walmart exclusive My First Comic line. The flip books will be 48 pages for readers ages 6 to 9 and feature top DC characters, activity pages, mazes, puzzles, matching games, and more. <laughs> they will retail for $4.97. And last, but certainly not least, Sweet Tooth has a second season coming on Netflix. No word on release date. And that's the news. Back to you, Jimmy. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah, Yay for Sweet Tooth. Love it. Uh, I've got a few things I'm going to recommend here in our top three. First up we have uh, from DC Comics, I Am Not Starfire by uh, Mariko Tamaki and Yoshi Yoshitani, two of my favorite creators and awesome, awesome people. Um, so this basically uh, is sort of out of DC continuity. It's he's, uh, um, DC's been doing this, this initiative with these uh, sort of short graphic novels or... Um, not necessarily short, but uh, different graphic novels um, outside of the continuity. So we have Starfire, of course, the famous Starfire from Teen Titans, has a daughter, 17-year-old Mandy, um, but who is nothing like her mom. She's maybe a little goth, a little weird, a little out there, but um, at least to society's you know, viewpoints to us, she's just a normal girl. Um, of course, Starfire is you know, the beautiful hair down to her ankles, you know, stunning hero uh adorable tall and sparkly etc uh, but mandy doesn't have power she's just a kid dyes her hair black doesn't really like anybody just her best friend lincoln um and since her mom's from the planet she can't re really relate to her she's having issues in school has to team with like the most popular girl named claire um for a science or some sort of project in school and has a little crush on claire and uh they, but then she's worried people sort of just use her to because of her famous mom and, you know, things like that happen. And then uh, the bad guy shows up and it's, uh, I won't want to go too much. Let's just say it's, it's, it's uh, familiar in a familial way, <laughs> the bad guy. And Mandy discovers, you know, herself in many different ways, not just in her true self and how she is, but also uh, within her relation to her mom and her mom, you know, being a superhero. And there's hints of who the father is, and we all kind of know who it is, you know, but he's not really uh, present in the life. Um, but, yeah, it's it's a really great tale. I had a really good time reading this. Mandy's, um, you know, she's she's that teen where it's like, you know, yes, it's teen angst, but, man, we all went through that where we just feel not like, like we don't belong and trying to find a way to fit in and or just be ourselves or find a way to discover ourselves. And uh, this is such a great tale um, from two amazing great creators who I – respect and love and think they're just the best uh and both have been on comic news inside in the past so they're really awesome people so check it out uh next up netflix a uh, kingdom ashen of the north if you haven't seen kingdom the korean zombie tv series it's two seasons in definitely do so and you'll be more familiar but if you haven't this is standalone you could you could watch this um but it it, it relates to a character um we saw in this series um but a little more of an origin story of of this character ashen and uh, how she got to be where she is. And yes, the zombies are incredible and scary and creepy. And it's action-packed, but it's such a great story. And it's beautiful. It's set, it's, you know, in the Joseon periods. It's very, you know, it's a timepiece and um, uh, really great stuff. I think you'll enjoy it. And finally, the last one is Jellystone with an exclamation point. It's a new HBO Max animated series by C.H. Greenblatt uh, with Jeff Bergman, Grace Helbig, Jim Conroy, Ron Funches, etc., uh, this is really fun. I binged it over the, the last uh, over the weekend, basically, and really enjoyed it. It's like familiar characters you know: Yogi Bear, Boo Boo, uh, Cindy Bear. Uh, there's Wally Gator. There's Jabberjaw. All Captain Caveman. All mixed together in this little town, and have different adventures. And Grace actually voices Cindy Bear and a few other characters, and it's 
she does a great job. It's a really good cast. And it's really fun. I had a really good time watching it. And it's nostalgic because, you know, old school characters we know and love. We may or may not have grown up. But if you haven't grown up on them, it's new for you and you'll love it. So check it out. Um, all right. Got anything to suggest to me? Contact me here. Email us at comicnewsinsider at yahoo.com. Go to facebook.com slash comicnewsinsider and hit the like button. And if you go to comicnewsinsider.com, all that information is there. Follow on Spotify and subscribe on iTunes to get this podcast automatically each week. If you want to contact your host, Jimmy, he's all over Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, etc. under the handle at Jimmy Aquino. That's at J-I-M-M-Y-A-Q-U-I-N-O. Yeah, best place is Twitter and Instagram to say hello and drop a little suggestion and things like that. Really, really appreciate it. And I uh, always do appreciate it. want to hear from you guys. Thank you very much. Um, all right. As I said, very quick and easy. Got to get out of here. I got to go talk to Gracie and then got some other stuff I got to do. <laughs> but um, so that means we're going to bust out of here. Uh, yeah, the Grace Hubbard interview will be up probably later this week, Wednesday, I'd say. Maybe tomorrow, maybe Tuesday. We'll see. And uh, can't wait to have a chat to her in ages to catch up with her. So uh, tune in for that. Thanks for listening. This is Comic News Insider. And Jimmy Aquino, of course.